suffice it to say that there is no dispute that a prisoner who is incarcerated in CMAX enjoys far less privileges and is subjected to much harsher circum circumstances than prisoners in normal maximum security centres. Urgency. The respondents have argued that the matter is not urgent. They say so on two grounds. Firstly, the applicant, that the applicants have been imprisoned in these same circumstances for a long time, in the case of the first applicant for years, and any urgency, the respondents say, is self-created. Secondly, they argue that it would make no difference to the applicants if they were detained at CMAX until the review ap application in Part B is heard. I have been referred to the judgment in Simul Simon versus National Commissioner, in which the applicant applied to be transferred from CMAX on the basis that his continued incarceration there amounted to torture. The court held that the urgency was self-created, in that it, it had apparently taken the applicant months to realize that he was being tortured. The applicant's delay in bringing the application timelessly was therefore fatal to the matter, and the application was struck from the roll. As will be seen below, this matter is distinguishable on the facts from Simon. Although the first applicant says that his incarceration amounts to torture in terms of Rule 43 of the United Nations Standard Minimum Rules for the Treatment of Prisoners, the so-called Nelson Mandela Rules, his case really hinges on the allegation that his further incarceration at CMAX is in conflict with the respondent's own standard operating procedures that only allow for the incarceration of a prisoner in CMAX for 18 months, save in certain exceptional circumstances. The first applicant has been there for four years. In my view, if a prisoner is incarcerated unlawfully, an application to rectify the position is inherently urgent. I will deal here under with the averment that the first applica applicant is unlawfully incarcerated. The first applicant has also alleged that the conditions under which he is incarcerated have caused him to suffer a mental breakdown. The allegation is denied by the respondents in a perfunctory manner, but they have made no effort to investigate the first applicant's complaints. But do not believe that the first applicant's averment should be rejected out of hand. I find that, as far as the applicant is con first applicant is concerned, excuse me, the matter is urgent. The same cannot be said for the second applicant. Although he says that he is also the victim of the same allegedly inhumane circumstances in CMAX, his continued incarceration falls within the four walls of the Correctional Services Act, 11 of 1998, the regulations and the standard operating procedures. The allegation that the circumstances in which the applicants are held amount to torture is denied by the respondents, and I do not intend to make any finding thereon. In my view, there is no urgent to the urgency to the second applicant's application. His application stands to be struck from the role for lack of urgency. Is the first, defendant uh, first applicant intended, entitled to be released from CMAX? The Bill of Rights contained in Chapter 2 of the Constitution protects the rights of all, including those of prisoners. Section 10 emphasizes the right to dignity. Section 12 protects all persons from the arbitrary depra deprivation of freedom against torture and against inhumane and degrading treatment. Section 33.1 guarantees administrative action that is lawful, reasonable and procedurally fair. Section 35 protects detainees, including sentenced prisoners, against conditions that are inconsistent with human dignity. In order to give effect to these constitutional imperatives, the Act, the Correctional Services Regulations, and the standard operating procedures for CMAX provide for certain standards that must be adhered to in detention centres. Of importance to this matter, specific standards and procedures have been laid down for the treatment of prisoners in maximum security facilities such as CMAX. Paragraph 4.2 of the CMAX Standard Operating Procedure, also known as SOPs, provides that prisoners are subjected to a mandatory three-phase treatment program for a minimum of 12 to 18 months. The intention with the prisoner's incarceration at CMAX is clearly to prepare him for integration into another maximum correctional facility and not to detain him at CMAX indefinitely. Paragraphs 4.2.3.2 and 4.2.3.3 .3 of the SOPs are insightful. And I quote, No offender may be kept at CMAX correctional facility for more than 12 to 18 months until, unless risks Proposed dictate otherwise and pre-approval is granted. In exceptional circumstances, 
where it is required for an offender to be incarcerated at CMAX Correctional Facility for a period longer than 12 to 18 months, written application must be submitted by the Centre of Origin to be approved by the National Commissioner or his or her delegate. Should this rule not be applied, the offender must be collected by the Centre Stroke Region of Origin. Close quotation. Evidently, CMAX personnel were also of the view that the first applicant should be returned to his centre of origin. On 17 January 2024, the acting chairperson CMC of CMAX wrote a memorandum to various persons, including the area commissioner, the acting regional head corrections Gha Teng, the acting deputy regional commissioner Gha Teng, and the regional commissioner Gha Teng. The memorandum requested leave to return the first applicant to his centre of origin on the grounds that he had been incarcerated at CMAX for longer than 18 months. The memorandum remarked that the first applicant had been, and I quote, mistakenly omitted from the list of offenders for 2020 that were transferred late last year to their centers of origin. Close quotation. The memorandum specifically states that, I quote, CMAX is supposed to keep prisoners, excuse me, CMAX is supposed to keep inmates for a period of 18 months and thereafter be transferred back to centres of origin upon good behaviour, close quotation. One Mr. C. J. Matlala commented that the first applicant's further incarceration at CMAX was contrary to the SOPs. The reply from the RH Corrections, which I presume is the regional head for Gauteng, was that, I quote, this offender is attending a high-profile case of murder involving a high-profile soccer hero. It is recommended that he continue to be housed in CMAX for security reasons. Close quotation. The request was consequently not approved. The acting deputy regional commissioner remarked that the request was denied because the first applicant was attending a critical case. The fact that a person is awaiting trial in a so-called high profile or critical case is not in terms of the SOPs a basis for the indefinite incarceration of that person in CMAX. The fact is that there are numerous murder trials held every day in which the accused are not incarcerated in CMAX. In fact, they are co-accused in the same trial as the first applicant who were not incarcerated in CMAX. The question then remains, what sets the first applicant apart from the others who are on trial in the same or in similar matters but are not incarcerated in CMAX? That, that question is not answered in these papers. However, even if they were of the official view that the first applicant should remain in CMAX, it was incumbent on the respondents to make that determination strictly in accordance with the procedures laid down in the SOPs. The respondents' counsel submitted that although they were a prisoner should ideally be kept in CMAX for no longer than 18 months, if it were necessary to extend the period, an application should be submitted in terms of paragraph 4.3.3 of the SOPs. The respondents attached one page extracted from the SAPs to their papers that said exactly that. However, when I have regard to the following page of the SAPs that did not form, form part of the respondents' papers, it became apparent that the extract presented by the respondents was incomplete and that it only contained half a sentence. The sentence continued on the following page to the effect that a written application to extend the period had to be submitted by the Centre of Origin, in this case, Johannesburg Medium B, to the National Commissioner or his delegate, and should such application not be brought, the prisoner was to be automatically collected by the Centre of Origin. Here there was no such application. Mr. Madiba's suggestion that the CMAX application to return the first applicant to Johannesburg Medium B was the application referred to in paragraph 4.2.3.3 is ill-founded. That application was in fact exactly the opposite to the application envisaged in the SOPs. In consequence, not only has the first applicant been incarcerated at CMAX longer than the SOPs provide for, also, no application has been brought to extend the period. The first applicant has, in my view, been detained unlawfully in CMAX beyond the 18-month period. Interdict. The reviewing court will be called upon to consider whether the first applicant has established the case for his contention that the incarceration in CMAX is inconsistent with the Constitution and whether it constitutes solitary confinement. I do not intend to tread on that path. I have to consider the normal requirements for an interdict as set out in Set Luchelu versus Set Luchelu, 
and is amplified in Webster versus Mitchell. In Setluchelu, the court set out the elements of an interdict as follows. One, a clear right, or at least a prima facie right, are open to some doubt. Two, where a prima facie right is established, that the applicant would suffer irreparable harm were the interdict not to be granted. Three, that there is no alternative remedy. In Webster versus Mitchell, the court said, and I quote, in an application for a temporary interdict, applicants' right need not be established on a balance of probabilities. It is sufficient if such right is prima facie established, though open to some doubt. The proper manner of approach is to take the facts as set out by the applicant, together with any facts set out by the respondent, which the applicant cannot dispute, and to consider whether, having regard to the inherent probabilities, the applicant could on those facts obtain final relief at a trial. The facts set up in contradiction by respondent should then be considered, and if serious doubt is thrown on the case of the applicant, he could not succeed. Close quotation. This application seeks to interdict the manner in which the state exercises its statutory powers with regard to CMAX prisoners. In Gould versus Minister of Justice and another, the court was also concerned with an application to interdict the exercise of statutory powers. It said that a, a higher standard applied and that the test in such a case is not whether an applicant could obtain final relief at trial, but whether it should be successful. It held that in the absence of mal of fide, such an interdict would not readily be granted. The same warning was conveyed in International Trade Administration Commission versus Score South Africa, P2I Limited, that the responsibility of a court was not to usurp the authority of other branches of government, but to ensure that the other branches exercise their authority in accordance with the Constitution. In National Treasury and others versus opposition to Urban Tolling Alliance and others, the Constitutional Court said, and I quote, in a dispute as the present one, this does not mean that an organ of state is immunized from judicial review only on account of separation of powers. The exercise of all public power is subject to constitutional control. Close, quote, close quotation. Nonetheless, I thoroughly take heed of the warning by Furneman J. in National Treasury that where one intrudes upon the domain of the, on an, of the executive on an interim basis, one should only do so in the clearest of cases. In my view, this is one of those cases in which it would be appropriate to grant an interdict. Firstly, the applicant's right not to be detained in CMAX in contravention of the Department of Corrections' own policy and without any due process has been established. Secondly, should the first applicant continue to be detained in these circumstances, not only may his mental health be at risk, his further incarceration will be unlawful and I would be allowing an ongoing wrong to be perpetrated. The first applicant's further incarceration beyond the 18-month period will likely result in irreparable harm to the first applicant. There are also no alternative remedies available. Finally, the balance of convenience favours the granting of the application. The first applicant will still be incarcerated in a maximum security facility. He will still stand trial and there is no evidence that the respondent's operations may be compromised. On the other hand, should he be moved from CMAX, the first applicant's mental health may well improve with exposure to other pr prisoners and to more normal conditions. As far as costs are concerned, it is, was suggested that costs should be reserved for the term termination in Part B. I believe that order to be appropriate. I make the following order. The first applicant shall be removed from the CMAX centre and returned to his centre of origin or to any other maximum centre sec security centre that may be convenient. Two, the second applicant's application is struck from a roll for lack of urgency. Three, the costs of Part A of the application are reserved for determination in Part B. I hand down the judgment. All right, Ms. Gillison. I'm just going to see you, please. All right, we're adjourned. All right.